makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. Asian currencies push back against a stronger dollar after the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen acknowledged the concerns of Japan and South Korea over sharp declines. Now, global chip makers TCMC expects revenue to jump as much as 30% this quarter on booming demand for AI. That is despite a downbeat report from one of its main suppliers, ASML, earlier this week. And also this week on Bloomberg UK, the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey says the inflation risk is higher in the U.S. compared to the U.K., opening up the prospect of a rate cut before the Fed. So first thing is first, as always, let's have a look at what the markets are telling us. Now, we did see a little bit of a correction. I don't know whether it's correction, but certainly um, the dollar uh, seeing a little bit of a dip. Now, stocks are climbing overall with uh, a lot of the earnings actually in focus. The couple of things that we're watching back for is, first of all, Asian currencies rallying as uh, actually authorities are pushing back against a stronger dollar. We had that press conference, and you can see one versus the dollar. We had that press conference by Janet Yellen basically um, not pushing back against some of the intervention that we saw there. So if you look at one leading the climb in some of the regional currencies, yen steady following the joint statement from Janet Yellen uh, with the finance ministers of Japan and South Korea that noted serious concern about the depreciation of the two Asian currencies. Now, to talk about the markets, to talk about dollar, and to talk about equities, I'm delighted to be joined by Peter Oppenheimer. He's chief global equity strategist at Goldman Sachs. He's also newly minted fairly newly minted author of Any Happy Returns, Structural Changes and Super Cycles in the Market. So, Peter, thank you so much. As thank always. you. And once again, congratulations on the book. There thank are a million you. questions. They're extremely difficult, which I'm sure you get day in, day out from a lot of investors. First of all, like what's supporting the markets? It feels that it, it's actually only AI almost. Well, there's been massive concentration in the markets. That's absolutely right. I mean, if you look at the period since interest rates started to rise in 2022, 60 to 70 percent of the return in the U.S. market has come from those mega tech companies and the narrative around AI has been central to it. But we shouldn't forget also that there's been a big shift in the last year in terms of expectations about growth. You know, this time last year, markets were pricing a very high probability of recessions, not just in the U.S., but elsewhere. And that's changed dramatically. And if anything, while interest rate expectations have adjusted, people are less optimistic about the speed of rate cuts, they've become more optimistic about growth uh, and labour markets remain very tight. And that ultimately, I think, is what's keeping risk assets like equities up. But Peter, when you look at the U.S. economy, I mean, it's really firing, it seems, on all cylinders. Now, there's, you know, some people are saying this is all thanks to immigration, and that's really what's supporting, and you see it, you know, feeding through productivity and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's putting pressure on, on dollars. So what does that mean for, for U.S. equities, especially in earnings season? Well, I think it's important to emphasize how strong the economy is. Um, despite the rises in rates we've seen over the last couple of years, we think the U.S. economy is going to grow close to 3% this year nearly 2.5% fourth quarter over fourth quarter, uh, far from the sort of recession that people believed. And that's down to strong labour markets, immigration, also strong um, private sector balance sheets. I think it's keeping the market up, but we shouldn't forget it is expensive. You know, the market trades at around 21 times earnings, well above uh, the previous peak of the last 20 years. And we think earnings are actually going to be OK, but not that spectacular. You know, year over year... Uh, earnings growth is likely to slow to around 3% for the S&P compared to about 8% in the fourth quarter year over year. So there is a slowdown. And again, most of the growth in earnings is coming from a relatively small number of super large companies. What do you expect? I mean, again, what's the biggest drive for a lot of these equities? And I know you're kind of, you, you look at sector by sector, you analyze balance sheets. But if China's, deep, you know, like, I guess, deporting deflation... Does that help with the Fed and does that give a lift to S&P? Uh, well, I think right now the concern that the market is absorbing is that inflation is not coming down as quickly as hoped. So, yes, growth is fine, but we're not likely to get the boost in terms of lower rates that the markets had expected and really priced in uh, for much of the first quarter. And I think that's causing some indigestion. Um, so earnings are really going to be crucial here. You know, how do earnings hold up? and particularly for those super large companies, not just in the US, but in other markets as well, because you know, we've noted that there's been a huge increase in market concentration in most of the major markets. You know, the, what we call the granolas in Europe, for example, the 10 or 11 biggest companies, 
also make up about a quarter of the value of the index of the 600 biggest companies. So again, what happens there, what happens to the dominant companies in Japan is going to be crucial. For now, they're doing very well because their margins are holding up extremely well. The market expects the 10 biggest companies in the US to actually boost their margins by nearly 400 basis points year over year. For the rest of the market, margins are likely to be flat or slightly down. If margins hold up, I think markets will be okay, but we're looking at relatively flat returns from here. But Peter, is it really sector by sector? I know the, the, you know, the luxury sector in Europe actually gave so much benefits, and now we're seeing even LVMH maybe beating expectations, but certainly on a downturn. Yeah, because the expectations are built up to be so good for these dominant companies because they've had quarter after quarter of solid margins and decent revenue growth. And they've been relatively immune from rising interest rates because their balance sheets have been very strong. And the market has really bifurcated into really rewarding these defensive growth companies, whereas unprofitable, very long duration growth, which was previously... Uh, outperforming in the years when interest rates were falling has suffered a bit because of the rise in the cost of capital. For us, we, we still like these quality, if you like, defensive growth areas, including things like technology and healthcare. But we also like balancing it now with areas of, of deep value because um, there are areas of value, value industries which have been long neglected that actually are now posting decent cash flow. Uh, they're buying back shares, paying dividends. But they really have a significant value advantage. But the, is that in the energy complex? or is In it energy, uh, in, in areas like banks, for example, in Europe, uh, which were underperformers for a decade or more, but actually now are generating pretty decent earnings. They're buying back shares, they're paying dividends, but they're still very cheap. So having a barbell between the sort of quality growth, which is expensive, um, but is posting still very good fundamental compounding earnings, and some of this deep value, we think, in a relatively flatter market environment, is a, good, is a good way to sort of hedge the risks. Peter, thank you so much. We'll be back with Peter Oppenheimer, Chief Global Equity Strategist at Goldman Sachs. We'll talk a little bit, uh, I guess, more about dollar strength and what that means for certain parts of the markets. Coming up, EU leaders have been arriving in Brussels, but can they actually come together to keep the bloc competitive? That's the story next, and this is Bloomberg. In terms of where we see Europe going forward, it is recovering and we are clearly seeing signs of recovery now, beginning timid and picking up in the course of 24 and our forecast for 25-26 is 1.5-1.6 percent growth. Well that was the ECB President Christine Lagarde speaking in Washington at the spring meetings of the IMF and the World Bank. Now Europe is watching as industrial policy in China and the US threatens to leave the continent behind. That's the backdrop for EU leaders meeting in Brussels who face tough decisions on keeping the region competitive. Now let's get more from our very own Oli Crook who's on the ground in Brussels. So Oli, alarm bells ringing. Are European leaders hearing them and what can they do? Yeah, we hear about Lagarde and the European recovery and kind of the sort of immediate term. What they're really concerned with is the European economy in the much longer term, right? This is sort of a question of competition abroad from China, from the United States. And for EU leaders, it's easy enough to criticize China, to throw up tariffs on things like EVs and other sectors. But the question is, they also need to look in the mirror and figure out how to remain more competitive. And looking in the mirror, they might see a familiar face, which was, in fact, ECB uh, predecessor Mario Draghi, who spoke this week in Brussels because he has been tasked with how to make Europe more competitive. Have a listen to how he summarized the issue. China, for example, is aiming to capture and internalize all parts of the supply chain in green and advanced technologies. The United States, for its part, are using large-scale industrial policy to attract high-value domestic manufacturing capacity within their borders. We are lacking a strategy for how to keep pace in an increasing cutthroat race. It requires us to act as a European Union in a way we never have before. 
And so Mario Draghi, Mr. Whatever It Takes for Europe, what it takes right now is radical change. And that is what is being discussed right now by EU leaders. They've gone into the discussion and they were discussing a report that was written by another former Italian prime minister, Enrico Letta, who put out 147 pages with detailed proposals on how to make Europe most com more competitive. And really it focuses on the single market because the Europe is not going to outspend the United States. It's not going to be better organized when a top-down approach is China. What it needs to do is have a stronger economic union. So that means he wants to see joint uh, borrowing for defense spending. It means a capital markets union so that capital can freely flow into these companies. The question is, of course, Francine, as ever, the politics, there is resistance to joint debt. There's potentially some room to make that uh, progress on the capital markets union and all of this ahead of the European election. Ali, thank you so much. Uh, Oliver Crook there in Brussels with a terrific roundup of some of the longer term issues. Still with us, Peter Oppenheimer, Chief Global Equity Strategist at Goldman Sachs. And Peter, when you, I was listening to, to Ali and I was thinking, you know, we have very short term problems or concerns like dollar strength, what, what the Fed does in the next couple of quarters. And then you have these long competition, like structural reform, you know, the cost of money, the cost of credit. Like you, you wrote this book also looking at some of the super cycles and structural changes in markets. Is there a danger that we're focusing so much in, in the present that we ignore? Or some of these larger shifts? I think so, Francine. I mean, there's so many things that are happening in terms of potential inflection points in the short-term cycle that people are very, very focused on what is urgent, but less on what's really important. And it's often these longer-term structural shifts which really shape the environment for investors and indeed companies over many years. And I think we are seeing some big changes, some of which are being discussed by the European leaders, you know, a pushback to globalisation. Uh, more uh, intervention from governments in terms of trade uh, politi policies and tariffs. Um, uh, industrial policy is becoming much more popular. Uh, and, of course, we're getting a higher cost of capital. Governments are also raising much more debt, and that's keeping long-term interest rates from falling. And all of this is happening at a time when the world is facing the joint uh, uh, sort of pressures of, of AI and decarbonisation. And so there's a lot to focus on here. Yeah. Uh, but importantly, I think in Europe's case, uh, there needs to be also a focus on investment because Europe is falling behind on the amount that companies are really investing. So some of it is institutional uh, and to do with rules and regulations, but some of it has to come bottom up as well. So, so again, what does that mean for, from an equity point of view? Can you, can you look at the trends now that we, mm. you know, will really shift and change in five, ten years and try to take advantage of it now, or do you just need to be aware of the forces so that you, do, you don't lose out? Well, I think, uh, you know, trying to identify those companies, many of them are in Europe, that are reinvesting and growing um, because they can compound those investments at a high rate uh, is very significant. You know, it's interesting, if you look at the amount of capex, growth capex and R&D uh, as a share of cash flow that's done. Uh, for the big uh, uh, 10 uh, tech stocks in the US, it's around 60%. For the granolas, the dominant European companies, it's 50, 55%. If you look at the average of the stock 600, uh, it's about 15 or 16%. So very much less reinvestment is being done. That's about half the rate of the average American company. So I think really identifying who can grow, uh, who has the ability to reinvest and what they're reinvesting in is a really important point. And where you have mature industries, uh, it's the real focus on shareholder value, buying back stocks, paying dividends. And that's really, I think, what uh, investors have to identify. And I, I mean, we talk so much about security. Defense is also something I mean, un unclear whether Europe can can kind of get, you know, get on the same page for, for that much longer. But is defence a, a place where we need to look at even... A, you know, a critical cyber? area, uh, Francine. I think you know, we have a defence basket of, of stocks mm -hmm. in, in Europe. It's, been, uh, it's, it's up 50% uh, you know, roughly this, this year. It was the best performing sector in the last two years. And there's a reason for that. You know, uh, governments are having to spend, sadly, more on defence. This also comes back to the pressures on government uh, budgets because mm -hmm. they're having to focus on defence, having to focus on industrial policy, on subsidies and tax breaks to encourage decarbonisation and energy transition. And of course, there are ageing populations. All of this means that government deficits are getting bigger. And that's happening pretty much everywhere globally, uh, which again is, is really keeping longer term interest rates higher. So, you know, what effect is that going to have on different industries and sectors and companies, I think is a central area of focus for, for investors as well.
Peter, thank you so much, as thank always, you. for coming on. Peter Oppenheimer, their chief global equity strategist at Goldman Sachs. Now, coming up, we take a close look, a closer look at a smart city set up to transform the Athens coastline and boost Greek GDP. Our exclusive interview with the Lambda Development Chief Executive next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, Greek builders Lambda are developing the site of the capital's former airport, which has become a symbol of Greece's economic recovery. The 650-acre site will become a new smart city with beachfront properties, a shopping mall, and a major new park. Well, joining us now for an exclusive interview is Lambda Development Chief Executive Odysseus Athanasiou. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. I mean, this is exciting because it also shows that Greece has been uh, doing extremely well and, and will likely continue to do so. What are you most hopeful about in the real estate, commercial and otherwise, for Greece? Yeah, we, I believe, good morning from my side uh, as well, Francine. Uh, I would say that the, this project that you mentioned is a symbol of a new Greece, a Greece that uh, is uh, regenerating after ten, year, 10 hard years that the whole world uh, followed uh, between 2010 and 2020. Uh, real estate is booming, and there are multiple reasons for that. One is that there is a huge imbalance between supply and demand. Supply of uh, new projects has gone down in these 10 years, and demand has gone up in the last two years. Uh, we got a lot of awareness uh, in the last uh, two years, three years, uh, because of uh, a government that is uh, very business friendly. Uh, tourism uh, has come back in big numbers from the U.S. also, and but from all uh, the West and Eastern Front uh, around Greece. And in general, we are living um, a boom that in terms of numbers mm -hmm. is shown in, in the fact that we have about 6 billion euros of foreign capital invested in uh, real estate, mainly in residential, just in the last three years, mm -hmm. compared to 1.5 billion euros in the decade between 2009 and 2019. Yeah. And so could you give me an idea of, of the kind of timeline that we're looking at for the project? So first of all, what's the value upside potential? By when will the first you know, bit of the development be delivered? Um, and, and when will it be fully finished? Yeah, the first phase of the project is about to finish in 2026, 2027. And when I say finish, I'm talking about uh, a project that in total has the size of three times Monaco, just to get a comparable. and the first phase covers all the coastline of four kilometers that will include uh, hotels, it will include residential, malls, uh, schools, education, um, and, and uh, health uh, venues. And we expect about uh, 1,500 apartments to be ready by Christmas of 2026, and um, the population is going to be there. This is our target, along with uh, a marina in which uh, we're going to have a Riviera Galeria full of uh, high-end uh, fashion stores. F&B, meaning restaurants and cafes, uh, 300 yachts to be there, and many tourists that will have the opportunity to visit what we call zip code uh, paradise. The capex that is going to be invested in this period is close to 3 billion euros. And uh, the good thing about this project is that in just two and a half years after acquisition of the land, we produce uh, yeah. profit in the results we announced uh, yesterday. And the cash collections from the residences we have sold so far comes to close to 650 million euros. So we're very happy about this because so, uh, we have brought to the market uh, 500 apartments and they are all sold out. And, and so how much, for example, will this project add to the country's economy? Do you have figures for that or is it estimates? Yes, yes. Uh, based, based on uh, independent service, we believe that it's going to add to the GDP about 2.5 points, 2.5 percent in the Greek GDP. Uh, it's going to add uh, 70 to 8,000 uh, jobs and it's going to bring at least 1 million uh, tourists. And we're not talking about uh, long-term future, like 10, 15 years. We're talking about in the next three years. As I said, Christmas of 26, we right. believe the first phase is going to be uh, in full mode. I mean, we're looking at, you know, profitability. Some of the return on operating assets have been doing quite well, as you're saying, very recently. How much, if, when the ECB cuts rates, and at the moment markets are expecting a cut by the European Central Bank in June, does that help with further developments or just your cost of constructing? Yes, I'm not sure I heard everything that you said well, but um, if you talk about uh, the interest rates and uh, the operating assets, is this what 
you included in your question, is that right? Yes, on interest rates and the European Central Bank. If they can't, yes. is that beneficial yes. to okay. you? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Look, look, the interest rates and uh, the trend that they have followed has hurt us perception-wise because, of course, it hurt all real estate stocks globally. Uh, and that's why we have a big discount mm -hmm. in our share price, for which I'm going to talk in a minute. However, we have locked our interest rate costs because we issued two bonds in 2020 and 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, the fixed coupon that we pay is 3.9% were fully locked until 2027. And by the way, these bonds are callable, so that means that if the central banks start decreasing the rates, we're gonna, we are in a position to convert this to variable interest rates from now on. But now we're locked at 3.9. Okay, so Our operating assets recorded an exceptional performance of 70% last year. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Athanasiou yeah. there from Landa Development. He's the chief executive. This is Bloomberg.